It's wonderful to see everybody today, but this is a hard funeral. It's hard because Peggy was taken from us so quickly by her illness. And it's hard because Peggy was so wonderful. She was truly a remarkable woman. And if you think you knew her, it was just the tip of the iceberg. Speaking as her pastor, I am particularly going to miss Peggy. I never wanted to get in a staring contest with Peggy in the middle of my sermon, because I would lose. At least I knew there was one person focused on what I was saying. I remember wonderful conversations with Peggy about my sermons, uh, reflecting on visiting her while she was sick, getting to see that one of the last pieces of food that she took was a little drop of communion wine and a small wafer, and getting to sing Silent Night, Holy Night with her just before December on the night she passed away. But something you may not know is that in the Guinness Book of World Records, you will find the names of Roland and Peggy Walker as the first ever couple to be married as the result of a computer matchmaking. <laughs> Decades before Match.com, there was the mainframe computer at Auburn University. Now, it seemed that the Office of Admissions and Advising at Auburn thought that it would be a wonderful War Eagle engineering idea to trust every freshman's schedule for the first fall semester to a brand new computer. The process was very simple. Of course, in those days, you had to do everything on punch cards. So a brilliant uh, advancement officer, guidance counselor, coded every single class in the university into a punch card code, and then put the correct number of punch cards for the seats in the auditorium. Students would then take turns going into the auditorium in the proper order and choose the cards they wanted for the classes they wanted to attend, feed them into the mainframe, and Hey presto, there's your schedule. So a young and vivacious Peggy Walker, who you see photographed here before you, went in, chose her punch cards at the proper time, and everything went just as planned, except for math. Now math had an error. It did not compute. And so Peggy had to go back, panicked, to the guidance counselor. Unfortunately, because she had already taken her slot, she had to wait until the end of the day to make a second draw. And it seems that there was only one last lonely punch card left for the 7 a.m. lecture. No self-respecting woman would want to get up before the crack of dawn to put on their makeup to go to the 7 a.m. lecture. But Peggy was forced to. And so she found herself as the only woman in a sea of men at seven in the morning, learning math, next to a dashing young engineer named Roland Walker. It was a match made in heaven and coded in binary. <laughs> Looking back with Roland this week, he told me that when he was a young man, he prayed. And he remembers praying that God would find a partner for him. And looking back after 55 years of marriage, he could just sit there in my office with a prayer of thanks saying, thank you, God. You gave me the perfect match, the perfect wife, a wonderful mother, a wonderful grandmother, a great friend and colleague. Peggy was brilliant. She began as a lab researcher, a lab technician. She trained right alongside the medical school students at Auburn. But when she had three such brilliant children, 
She decided to stay home and to uh, teach them and to nurture them until they were of age. And then when she finally got the opportunity, she decided she'd go back to work. She became a substitute teacher at the last minute at a small school, but quickly received battlefield promotions at some of the finest private schools in the South, becoming the AP biology teacher at Jacksonville, at uh, Episcopal in Jacksonville, at Randolph here in Huntsville, rising to the rank of head of the science department, receiving accolades and honors for her science teaching, science teacher of the year for Alabama, a remarkable woman of learning, of curiosity. And it reminds me of the best student that Jesus ever had. And we read his story in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Listen now for God's word. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to this one, Go, and he goes. I say to this one, Come. And he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to all those who followed him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such faith. Then the, Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now credit where credit is due. This passage was brilliantly selected, not by me, but by Peggy's son, David. And it's because he said that Peggy was like the centurion a person who knew what it was to be in authority. <laughs> Roland asked uh, David one day, because David was in Peggy's class, her AP biology class, what is it like with your mom in the classroom? What is she like when she's teaching? And David said to Roland, she exerts dominance over the space. It's hard for me to picture it because I know her from the narthex, but she was larger than life in the classroom. Beth also had her as a teacher, and she said, you know, if you get an F from your mom on a test in the morning, it makes dinner conversation real awkward at the dinner table in the evening. Now, Amy, who is herself a professional biologist, she is a professional scholarly uh, researcher in the field of biology, is quick to point out the benefits of having a brilliant scientist as a mother and the wonderful childhood the kids had growing up, focusing more on frogs and dirt than lace and ribbons, even in the South. And it's one of the interesting things to me that as we look at this cross-cultural encounter with Jesus in the Gospel according to Matthew, this Western Latin or Greek-speaking centurion, European, is coming across this Jewish rabbi, Jesus. And what does he see? Like a good AP biology student, this centurion has become familiar with the inductive method. There's a wonderful letter in Peggy's files that she has from a student who says that uh, Mrs. Walker teaches us how to think for ourselves. 
She doesn't give us the answer. She makes us continue to make observations until we find the answer. And that is exactly what this centurion has done. He sees a man who commands the waves, who can raise the dead, who can multiply food. And he says to himself, this is a man in authority. In Greek, the word kurios, or Lord. You see why he is not willing to let Jesus come into his home, even though in that uh, historical period, the centurion would have ranked far superior to a lowly Jew in Palestine. Instead, he says, Lord, I am not worthy for someone as powerful as you to enter my home. But I have observed the experiments that you have been conducting in this laboratory. And I am confident of the result. If you say my servant will be healed, he will be healed. It's even more interesting if you look at this word to be healed in the Greek. Iaomai. Because ancient Greek and Roman scientists would use this word not just for physical healing, but for intellectual healing. Euripides, Plato, Epictetus, Sallust, Thucydides all used this same Greek word to say that education heals ignorance. It was something right out of Peggy's own philosophy of education. Once asked what was her philosophy of teaching, she said that science gives our next generation the tools to change the world. But they are the vectors, the actors, who will make that change. She almost exactly, probably unwittingly, quoted Plato when she told Roland once, I have to teach these kids science because they're going to grow up to vote. It was a beautiful Greek way of thinking that education heals the mind for ignorance and forms human beings for effective service, effective discipleship. That's why Jesus looks around at his disciples, the people following him all this time, seeing him do miracle after miracle, and he says, this student gets the A. Y'all get an F. We're going to have an awkward dinner conversation about this. He understands. Now the centurion story is about more than just mental healing though. He's very clear that his servant is paralyzed with crippling, debilitating pain. It's put right in the middle of two other stories of healing that Matthew tells us. The story of a lame man who is cured of his disability and takes up his mat and walks. The story of Peter's mother who has a high fever and looks like she's about to die when all of a sudden Jesus heals her and she begins cooking dinner for everyone. And then Matthew says that these three stories of healing are the three experiments that Jesus did to give empirical evidence for the hypothesis of the prophet Isaiah. Or as he puts it, to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 53. But Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord, the one in authority, has laid on himself the iniquity of us all. The good news of this passage is that in Jesus Christ, God has turned the tables in reality. As the centurion says, Jesus is the one with authority over life and death, sickness and health, sin and forgiveness. 
We think that we have come here as the healthy to grieve the sick. But in the reality, it is we who have gathered as the sick to praise God for the one among us, our sister Peggy, who now is healed. The Lord Jesus Christ has taken Peggy on his own shoulders and by his wounds, all of her sins, all of her sickness has been totally restored. And she is now perfectly well in her father's arms. Because the good news that we celebrate today is that before Peggy was a brilliant teacher, before she was a wonderful scientist, a great wife, mother, daughter, mom, grandmother, colleague, teacher, friend. Before the foundations of the world, not based on anything she did, but just because of who she is, God chose her to be his daughter, a princess in his royal heavenly court to take up his cross for her so that she could stand before him totally healed. In this Advent season, we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. We look forward to being re reunited with all of our loved ones, including Peggy, at the resurrection. And we know that even now, she is walking into his heavenly throne room, hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Be healed, be whole, be at peace. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.